Kungabe Hare
Jai Hun Bishampad Paramahansa Pari Bajakacharya Sith of the Shishman, His Divine Grace Abhai Chiran, Bhukti Vedanta Sai Mara Shila Prabhupada Ki. His Khan BBT Founder Chaya Jagat Guru Shila Prabhupada Ki. Ananta Kota Vaishnavrinda Ki. Nam Char Sahai Das Thakur Ki Sorry for the distraction. Oh, glorious to Srila Prabhupada. Om Namo Bhagavati Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavati Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavati Vasudevaya Krishna Sadamo Pagate Damagana Dibi Saha Kalana Sadashum Mesha Parana Ko Nidodita Narada Namaskucha Naram Shaivam Narotama Devim Sadasatim Vyasam Tatojaya Mudirayat <coughs> I am, in addition to being mentally enfeebled, I am dealing with a bear of a cold, so uh, I apologize for my coughing, hacking, and wheezing. Take it as a manifestation of one of the uh, threefold miseries. I am definitely in the midst of it. So we are on third canto, text 25, chapter 25. Text 21. Titikshara Karunika Surada Sava Dehinam Ajata Shatrava Shanta Sarava Sadu Bhushana Titikshara Karunika Surada Sarva Dehinam Ajatta Shatrava Shanta Sarva Saru Bhushanaha Tatikshava Karunaka Surada Sarva Dehinam Ajatta Shatrava Shanta Sarva Saru Bhushana Titikshava Karunika Surada Sarva Dehinam Achata Shatrava Shanta Sarva Saru Bhushana Vaishnavis? No? To take Shiva. Tolerant. Karunika, merciful. Surada, friendly. Savadehina, to all living entities. Ajata Shatrava, inimical to none. Shanta, peaceful. Sarava, abiding by the scriptures. Sarabhushanaha, Adorned with the sublime characteristics. The symptoms of a sadhu are that he's tolerant, merciful, and friendly to all living entities. He has no enemies, he is peaceful, 
and he abides by the scripture, and all of his characteristics are sublime. Also, you say, the symptoms of a sadhu are that he's tolerant, merciful, friendly to all living entities. He has no enemies. He's peaceful. He abides by the scripture, and all of his characteristics are sublime. Purport. A sadhu, as described above, is a devotee of the Lord. His concern, therefore, is to enlighten people in devotional service to the Lord. That is his mercy. He knows that without devotional service of the Lord, human life is spoiled. A devotee travels all over the country, from door to door, preaching, be Krishna conscious, be a devotee of Lord Krishna. Don't spoil your life in simply fulfilling your animal propensities. Human life is meant for self-realization or Krishna consciousness. These are the preachings of a sadhu. He is not satisfied with his own liberation. He always thinks about others. He is the most compassionate personality towards all the fallen souls. One of his qualifications, therefore, is karunika, great mercy to the fallen souls. While engaged in preaching work, he has to meet so many opposing elements, and therefore the sadhu, or devotee of the Lord, has to be very tolerant. Someone may ill-treat him because the conditioned souls are not prepared to receive the transcendental knowledge of devotional service. They don't like it. That is their disease. The sadhu has the thankless task of oppressing upon them the importance of devotional service. Sometimes devotees are personally attacked with violence. Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. Haridas Thakur was caned in 22 marketplaces. And Lord Chaitanya... Lord Chaitanya's principal assistant, Nityananda, was violently attacked by Jagai and Madai. But still, they were tolerant because their mission was to deliver the fallen souls. One of the qualifications of a sadhu is that he's very tolerant and merciful to all fallen souls. He's merciful because he's the well-wisher of all living entities. He is not only a well-wisher of human society, but a well-wisher of animal society as well. It is said here, Sarvadehinam, which indicates that all living, which indicates all living entities who have accepted material bodies. Not only does the human being have a material body, but other living entities, such as cats and dogs, also have material bodies. The devotee of the Lord is merciful to everyone, the cats, dogs, trees, etc. He treats all living entities in such a way that they can ultimately get salvation from this material entanglement. Shivananda Sen, one of the disciples of Lord Chaitanya, gave liberation to a dog by treating the dog transcendentally. There are many instances where dogs got salvation by association with a sadhu, because a sadhu engages in the highest philanthropic activity for the benediction of all living entities. Yet, although a sadhu is not inimical towards anyone, the world is so ungrateful that even a sadhu has many enemies. What is the difference between an enemy and a friend? It is a difference in behavior. A sadhu behaves with all conditioned souls for their ultimate relief from material entanglement. Therefore, no one can be more friendly than a sadhu in relieving a conditioned soul. A sadhu is calm, and he quietly and peacefully follows the principles of scripture. A sadhu means one who follows the principles of scripture and at the same time is a devotee of the Lord. One who actually follows the principles of scripture must be a devotee of God because all the Shastras instruct us to obey the orders of the personality of Godhead. Sadhu, therefore, means follower of the scriptural injunctions and a devotee of the Lord. All these characteristics are prominent in a devotee. A devotee develops all good qualities of the demigods, whereas a non-devotee, even though academically qualified, has no actual good qualifications or good characteristics according to the standard of transcendental realization. And so it starts. Oma gena timarindasya gena gena salakaya jakshu shimlitangena tazari shi gurave namaha. So, Prabhupada was on a radio show in Los Angeles and we, the majority of the devotees, can we see, there's no way to stop this grinding, that's just life. He loves it because it means progress. 
No, he does. To him, it is music. <laughs> anyway, so there was a radio show in Los Angeles, and Prabhupada was on. It was late at night, and we were all back at the ashram, huddled around the radio. And uh, the man was famous for being uh, confrontational and aggressive. The, the ras of the show was that uh, uh, the guests were slapped around and embarrassed. And they invited Prabhupada. So the devotees, said, the devotees described to Prabhupada, Prabhupada said, how many people listen? They said, oh, Prabhupada, there's over three million people. Prabhupada said, can we chant? They said, we don't know, but Prabhupada said, all right, we'll go. So Prabhupada went. So the guy started right off the bat. He said, um, you know, what can you possibly teach us? You've come from India. This is 1970. Death rate is so high in India. What can you teach us? Why don't you just go back to India? Prabhupada said, as far as I have seen, Death rate is the same everywhere, 100%. <laughs> Which kind of, you know, took the guy by surprise. Then the guy said, I'm trying to think of the different things. Oh, <laughs> then the guy said to Prabhupada, but I hear that in your scripture, they say the world is flat. Prabhupada said, everywhere I walk it is. <laughs> and then he turned, he turned to Karanda and said, except for New Vrindavan, because New Vrindavan has all those hills, you know? So the guy didn't know what to say. He was a little kind of stunned for a moment. The, his, he had a lady assistant, and she stepped in, and she said, but why do you shave your head? Prabhupada said, why do you shave your legs? <laughs> Prabhupada said, better a cool brain and warm legs. So she was out of the game. She was, you know, <laughs> the guy stepped back in. He'd, he'd, he'd oh, it was so sweet. The guy, he'd, reco he'd recovered, and finally he said, in exasperation, he said, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> well, what would happen if, if, if everyone became a Krishna bhakta, Krishna conscious, what would happen? Prabhupada said, don't worry, there'll always be fools like you. <laughs> no. the, the full sentence, Prabhupada said, don't worry, there'll always be fools like you who won't. I mean, Prabhupada told us later on, he said, uh, when he got back, you know, the devotees were just in ecstasy. And Prabhupada said, he said, I can do this, but you cannot. Prabhupada said, it's the special dispensation of old men and little children. They can go anywhere and say anything. But my observation, actually, we're a little sidelined, but my observation is people could sense, I mean, Prabhupada could say the heaviest things, but because pr there was no envy, there was no animosity, Prabhupada was just trying to open up their heart and help them. And people, most people, well, sometimes they went off, we'll go about that in a second, but most of the time they, re they could sense that Prabhupada actually cared about him, so could, Prabhupada could get right in there and do surgery, you know, on the heart. Anartha. But the point Prabhupada made, which brings us to this verse, because the man said, what would happen if the whole world became Krishna conscious? And Prabhupada quoted this verse and described the qualities of the devotees. So people are trying to solve the problems of the world, but in modern phraseology, they call that end of pipe solutions. I have a toxic factory over here, and it goes through all the f this and that, and, and it's pouring pollution into the lake. So I put a filter on where it comes out at the pipe. That's in the pipe solution. But it's confirmed, it's, it's much, has a much better effect, is less expensive, more efficacious, so much, if you deal with it at the cause. Better to solve at the cause than at the end of the pipe. So we want to make a better world. Anyone who's got any kind of sensitivity or observation has got their head out of the clouds or the ground, we have to make a better world. And that better world is not all moving around matter and changing all the conditions. You've got to change the consciousness. 
And that consciousness is manifest here. What happens if the whole world becomes Krishna conscious? Well, just imagine a world full of people with all of these conditions. I had a great experience. I was in Radhakund chanting some japa. I was not looking for the Babaji's. I was praying to Ragnathas Goswami that I may, anyway, whatever. So I was chanting. And I saw across the Kund, I saw these two old men, old, old Babaji's, and they were each in their own reverie. They were in their own world. You know, the little gumptious, I mean, it was fantastic. And they met at the top of the stairs. They were completely oblivious to each other till they met at the top of the stairs. And they each had a little loda. I couldn't hear, but you could see just by body language what was happening. And obviously, one of them, old, old men, one man said, oh, you know, Prabhu, you don't want to go all the way down the stairs. I have to go anyway. Let me take your loda. I'll get water for you. And the other Babaji said, no, 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 no. I, I have to go. I'll get for you. Each wanted to serve the other. And they were each holding on to each other's pots. And they were so old that they were tugging, they both fell over. <laughs> so then they were laughing. They were there, oh, well, this isn't working. So I don't know, obviously, I, just again, I couldn't hear, but you could see that they worked it out. All right, you go today. So one old Babaji went down with both pots, you know, and then they, they were saying, okay, then tomorrow I'll go for you. So they worked it out. And I was thinking, this is Vaishnava, such a sweet, so we, it begins with the heart. The I did take some notes to help my frail consciousness, but um, there's a process. On one hand, yes, bhakti automatically, jnana vairagya, they come automatically. And if you do a word search, it's fun to do sometimes, do a word search on the word automatically, you know, prophet's folio, it comes up a lot. And it doesn't mean like osmosis, that I just, you know, we call it Krishna unconsciousness, that if I just surround myself with Krishna consciousness, it'll somehow to get into my head and my heart. It doesn't mean that automatically. What it means is that if we simply execute devotional service, serve the Vaishnavas, serve the Sankatan mission, chant nice japa, study the Shastra, if we just follow the process given to us, automatically. That means with confidence. We can have confidence. We can have certainty that if we follow the process, we'll get the result, and the result are all these good qualities. So we don't need to externally, I mean, we should obviously, I don't want to get too far afield, we should obviously read Prabhupada's books, we should obviously, Prabhupada said, what is the use of a fat sannyasi? I mean, you know, speaking to myself, we should be austere, you know, all those things, but they will come automatically as a byproduct of that simple, honest, devotional service. So that we know for sure. At the same time, Prabhupada talks about cultivation of devotional service. One of those wonderful sutras, I was a bhakt in Los Angeles, trying to be a bhakt, I'm still trying, but I was in Los Angeles and Prabhupada was giving class every morning for a number of months. And one of the sutras Prabhupada said, was it a sign of intelligence is the ability to balance opposing points within the mind. I'll say it again. It's a great sutra. The, one of the signs of intelligence is the ability to balance opposing points within the mind. And we have that at Chinta Beta Beta Tattva. It's the same idea. So on one hand, automatically, we just humbly do our duty. And at the same time, we want to cultivate, we want to progress. So, what are the, what is the, I'm a gardener. I, 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 that's really what I do best on a sliding scale. And you can plant the seed you can water it. Those are all, you have to have the seed. You have to have the water. Those are all necessary conditions. But, and don't overthink it, what else do you need to have? You have to have some good soil. Yeah, yeah, he's a farmer too. So you have to, you have, to have some good soil. And that combination. 
So what are the necessary conditions? What is a necessary condition that helps these qualities, which we all want to aspire to, which individually and collectively will make a better world? But I, before we get there, what is that foundational condition we're going to get to in a second? But just to nail home the point of the value of external first, external later. I was recently in um, New York City. And I was flying to Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is a little Cuban island, a uh, Cuban, a little Caribbean island off Florida. So I was going from big New York City to tropical uh, Puerto Rico. In the New York airport, has a picture of a Puerto Rican beach. You can imagine aquamarine water, palm trees, white sands, always two sets of footprints, which is a confirmation of the aversion of impersonalism. Nobody wants to be there alone. They want to be with someone. But anyway, um, and it said, go nuts in this big city. Noise, confusion, chaos. Go to Puerto Rico. Tranquilo, nice and calm and peaceful. Okay, there it is. I landed in Puerto Rico, I swear to you. I did not even get outside the airport. Inside the airport, when I'm going to baggage claim, big picture of the New York City skyline. <laughs> Nighttime, bright lights. Said, going nuts on this little island with nothing to do. Go to New York, that's where the action is. <laughs> so I said, well, hang on a minute. Everybody in New York thinks, well, it's miserable here, but they must be happy in Puerto Rico. And everybody in Puerto Rico says, this island, I'm going nuts here, I'm going to New York. So hang on a minute, where is that happiness? You know, is it 6,000 mile distance, so 3,000 miles, that's, you know, 30,000 feet over Atlanta, that's where happy is? I don't think so. So we have a culture, we have a fish, doesn't, of course, I've never talked to a fish, neither have they communicated to me, but the principle is there that a fish doesn't know that it's in water. Just like we don't feel atmosphere, you know, whatever they call it, there's the, was it the barometrical pressure or whatever? Air has pressure, climate has pressure. We're moving through pressure, but we don't feel it. We're climatized to it. As the fish doesn't feel that it's in water. We are moving through a culture. We're moving through a worldview value. It's becoming one world, gift of America and our, you know, modern media. It's becoming one set of values, one set of worldview. And that worldview is simply based on if I can just get the right conditions, I'm going to be happy. But it doesn't work. I mean, we, that's a whole section. But Therefore, if we want, if conditions don't make us happy, consciousness makes us happy. And uh, 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 a breakdown of, this, of the qualities of that consciousness are given in this verse. If we individually have these qualities and it's expanded around the world, that's your peace formula. That's your happy, better world. That's your better life. We, Krishna describes in 18th chapter Bhagavad Gita, it's the same sensual experience. You know, what is it? Uh, understanding, determination, happiness, all those different qualities are in the different modes of nature. So it's the same sensual experience. The same data is coming in. But according to the consciousness, according to what mode of nature, one, people are experiencing it completely differently. So same sensual experience, same reality, same data, but due to consciousness, three modes of nature, totally different experiences by the individuals. So, you know, we had a, perf how much, to, okay. Jai. The, Give you an example. 
I was standing next to Tomal Krishna Goswami, one of the heroes. You know, they say in the West, we, st we stand on the shoulders of giants. Of course, as Vaishnavs, we don't stand on the shoulders, we take the dust from the feet. But one of the great heroes of our society, we're all in de there's so many of these great heroes. So I was standing next to Tamal Krishna Maharaj, we were at the University of Michigan, and a nice bhajan party is going on there. And this professor came up to us, and Tamal Krishna Maharaj said, oh, he was a professor of world religions or something. Tamal said, have you read Bhagavad Gita? Ah, he's a world, he's a, you know, University of Michigan, it's a good university, he's a professor of religion. He was a little indignant. He said, of course I've read Bhagavad Gita. So Tamal Krishnamarsh in his own expert way said, well, did you understand it? I mean, the man was even more, what do you mean? Of course I understood it. And then Tamal said to him, Tamal Krishnamarsh said, so what are you going to do? And you saw this puzzled look go over the man's face. And that the idea that Bhagavad Gita was a call to action that it was, as Prabhupada says, to, meant to cause a revolution in the hearts of impious men, you know, p people. That had never hit him. It was interesting philosophy, armchair, but it was meant to change his life and change his activities that he never absorbed. So, I was just thinking, oh, so that's what made me think of it, small Christian Marsh. Um, the in the section of Bhagavad Gita, when Krishna described, Arjuna asked, what is knowledge, what is, you know, the doer, what is, Arjuna asked that set of questions, 13th chapter. And Krishna's responding, what is knowledge? And he gives all the different features, aspects of knowledge. The first quality Krishna lists is humility. And Prabhupada describes in the pur purport and elsewhere, Without humility, humility is the key. It is the necessary precursor for knowledge or wisdom to develop. It is the first symptom of genuine knowledge. One becomes humble. So Tamal Krishnamarsh told me a story. He said he had just become appointed. This must be, I don't know, 68, 69. It was before he went to London when he was in Los Angeles. Brahmachari. And <coughs> I'm sorry. He was appointed a temple commander, which he was quite pleased with, of the Los Angeles Temple. And at the time, hold on a sec. The LA Temple was the largest temple in Iskcon. There we go. And he was the temple command. He wasn't the temple president. He wasn't the vice president. He wasn't the, you know, but he was the temple commander. And I think the total in the temple was about maybe 35 devotees living in the temple. Let's, let's bust out, maybe 40. So Tamal Krishnamar said, he went to Prabhupada and he said, Prabhupada, I'm concerned that now I have this very important powerful position, I'm going to become puffed up. It's going to give rise to pride and, and I'm going to, you know, forget myself, become lost in this, the influence of this powerful position. Prabhupada told him, you just think like this. You think that Krishna expands as Mahavishnu. Karanadakshai Vishnu. And it's only one fourth of the, uh, of the entire creation. Just a small corner of the spiritual sky, you have Karanadakshai Vishnu. And then from Karanadakshai Vishnu, so many universes are emanating. And every universe, Krishna expands again, Garvadakshai Vishnu. And then Lord Brahma comes, lotus flower and create so many planets. So, and those bubbles are just coming out and you know, with every inhale and exhalation of 
Mahavishnu, they're coming and going. And in every bubble, there's Lord Brahma, so many planets. And every planet, so many continents. Every continent, so many countries. Every country, so many provinces or states. Every state, so many counties. Every county, so many cities. Every city, so many streets. Every street, so many buildings. Every building, so many rooms. And in one of those rooms is Tamal Krishna thinking, I'm very important. <laughs> so Prabhupada said, you just think like this, you know. So they have a saying about, oh, someone's humble. And they say, yeah, and he's got much to be humble about. So we actually, if we, if we think of what our actual position is, I mean, you're all great Vaishnavas, certainly this array over here are, have come to help Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission. But I know my own place. You can put a, it says, you can put a dog on a throne, but you throw a shoe, he'll jump off for the shoe. I know who I am. And somehow or other, I was given the grace to be in the association of Vaishnavas. So we have much to be humble about. And that, I did want to tell, again from the Gita, because I do want to say some examples of Prabhupada exemplifying these qualities. But Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, one who is not in contact with the Supreme, I think it's second chapter, verse 66, I think. Someone who's not in contact with the Supreme cannot have transcendental intelligence. One who doesn't have transcendental intelligence cannot have a steady mind. If you can't have a steady mind, you can't have peace. And where is the question of peace without happiness? Now our premise is here is con we all want to become happy. Happiness is rest on not conditions but consciousness. And here Krishna lays up, it's sequential. I want to become happy. Take the bottom baseline, like Anamoya. You know, in many places, Jiva Goswami does it in Satsandharva. Take a, a universal common bedrock phenomena, an irreducible, like you can reduce 16 30 seconds to 8 30, uh, wait, 8 16, and 8 say 4 8, and you ultimately it gets to a point it's irreducible. There are irreducible human phenomena. And Bhagavatam addresses them. It is not theoretical, it is not romantic. I mean, there's romance and there's everything in the Bhagavatam. But it deals with the baseline of human existence, human experience. In the same way, hey, unless there's some closet masochist here who wants to out himself, everybody want to be happy here? Now, how you define happiness, the ant's looking for Sandesh. I mean, every, we define happiness differently. But that everyone wants happiness is universal. And just see how Krishna lays it out. You want to become happy? Okay, we all accept that. It's a universal desire. Not just human beings, but every, day, every living entity. Tree will bend towards the sun. <clears throat> so, oh, jeez. I'm trying to deal with all these. So you want to become happy. Well, what does Krishna say in that verse I just read? What is a precursor, a necessary condition for happiness? You've got to have a peaceful mind. If your mind isn't peaceful, how... One minute, well, I was sitting in the room. Devotee said, oh, but Prabhupada, they have so much opulence in the West. Prabhupada said, what is that opulence? He said, their opulence is glass and plastic. You know, real glad, gold, jewelry, fresh fruit, cows, you know, that's another thing. But then Prabhupada wasn't even satisfied with that. Prabhupada liked to lay it on, you know, just to just cut him down to the ground. Prabhupada said, first of all, he said, you know, what is that opulence? They don't even have, their opulence is glass and plastic. And then Prabhupada said, actually, they do not even have the opulence of one moment's peace of mind. They're always agitated. So you've got to have peace of mind. You want to be happy, you've got to have peace of mind. Okay, well, how do I have peace of mind? What is the next thing Krishna says in that verse? It's a progression. One unfolds to the other. You've got to have steady, steady mind. You know, if your mind is zip, zip, zip all over, the, they, they're finding in education now, we have a professor, uh, he teaches, it's the science of education. It's a real problem. I mean, I don't want to be trite, something we've all heard before, but all these video games and everything, 
It's destroying people's uh, uh, span of attention. The average student now, their mind are just jumping. They're used to being stimulated, screen, 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 stimulation, 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 you know, stimulation response, stimulation response. So they can't really focus. And it's becoming a problem in universities and in schools educating people because they're so agitated. Their mind is So you can't have, you want happiness, you have to have peace. You can't have peace unless you have a steady mind. What does a steady mind rest on? Transcendental intelligence. And Prabhupada describes in the purport <laughs> that transcendental intelligence means understanding that there's Krishna, there's the material world, there's the spiritual world. It means having an idea. Like when you go to a mall, I mean, I'm sure they have it here. They say, you are here. You know? Okay, it's the first Sambandha. If you know Sambandha, if you know how everything lays, Sambandha Abhideya. Okay, here's everything in relationship to everything, a helicopter view of existence. Okay, here's where it all is, and here's where I'm at. Okay, now what do I do about Abhideya? And it ultimately comes to Parojana. But the point is, transcendental intelligence means to, to, uh, to see, to have, to have a transcendental helicopter view of what's happening in this world, who am I? Prophet said, only devotees know what is what and who is who. So, The beginning of coming to that vision is understanding our position in the world, which breeds humility. From that humility, byproducts of humility, is a sense of gratitude. First step in God realization. You know that chapter, first step in God realization, and it's describing the Virata Rupa, the universal form. Prophet says repeatedly the whole, not the whole point, but one of the points is to develop in the living entities a sense of dependence. That, wait a minute, I'm not Lord of all I survey. I'm, from Prophet says, I'm being, actually, the living entities are being kicked like footballs. It means, you know, a soccer, or, you know, you know football. That's our actual position. We're being cooked, kicked by, like footballs. So, and we're t completely dependent. Prophet said, he saw that, what is it, uh, anyway, it's an American advertisement for an insurance company, and it's got, a, all you can see is the hands, it's got the palms, the hands, cupped hands, it's got a house, it's got the nuclear family in America, it's got the faithful dog, Fido. And it says, you're in good hands with all state. Prophet saw it, he goes, ah, yokesh mum bahamiya hum. That, you know, we're in Krishna's hands. I was sitting in the room one time, Prophet said, you think you're sitting on the floor? I am sitting in the hand of Krishna. So that sense of gratitude, that hum once we understand our humble position in the world, again, this is a progression, one of the byproducts, one of the next steps, is a sense of gratitude. Prabhupada was peeling an orange, sitting on his desk in San Diego. He peeled, nice, um, a tangerine, we call it, but it's big, nice. Prabhupada peeled it, and then he broke it off into sections, and he just, with the sweet innocence of a child, not childish, childlike. Prabhupada said, how can they say there's no God? It comes so nicely packaged. And he figured, I mean, it's organic, it, it goes right into the ground, we'll, we'll die, we'll be dead and gone, and the plastic we used yesterday will still be here, you know? And it comes so nicely packaged, individual servings, I mean, it's just, and it's just one thing. Prabhupada was sitting in Los Angeles again uh, in his room. If you've ever been to LA, Prabhupada, that first, his darshan room, and there's that big window behind it. So it was a cold and windy day. Everyone was all rugged up, as they say, down under. Everyone had, you know, chad or cap, and you know. And we were sitting here, and Prabhupada was sitting behind his desk. And you've all seen it sometimes. The, the cloud cover will break in one spot and the light will come down like a torch or a spotlight, like, you know, like a, like, a, like a spotlight. So we're all in the dark, literally and figuratively. Clouds clear for one spot, and this shaft of light came right down on Srila Prabhupada. Literally, he was bathed in this golden light. It was really a wonderful scene. And Prabhupada didn't miss a thing. Prabhupada said, yes. 
He said, someday you will feel this light just like your lovers embrace. You know, Krishna says, I'm the light of the sun and the moon. So if one develops a sense of humility, then one develops a sense of, uh, of being grateful. Being grateful that, wait a minute, Krishna's taking care of me. The light of the sun and the moon, nice, so many things. And in that consciousness, one becomes self-satisfied. Everybody now wants, what is it? God give us this day our daily bread. Om Jaya Jagadish Hari. Give me a new car and a house by the sea. So everybody wants, imagine you have somebody who claims to be your friend, but every time you see him, he asks you for something. The only time he comes. I, anyway, I don't want to go off the track, but in my family we had a dimwit uncle, and the only time he showed, he's my father's brother, the only time we ever saw that guy is when he needed money. Guaranteed. He'd ring the door, my father said, don't open it, let me get my wallet first, you know. It was just the nature of the guy. So, but think about the materialistic, you know, uh, fruitive devotion. Every time, God give me this, God give me that, I want this, I want that, please save me, please help. How does, how do you, how do us as individuals, per, God, Krishna's a person, he's the supreme person. How would we feel if every time we saw somebody, they just wanted something from us? Would we consider them a close friend? Practically, we wouldn't even, we would consider them an acquaintance, but you wouldn't consider them a close friend. But what about someone, the only time they ever see you, whenever you see them, they want to help you. They want to give you something. They, that kind of, you open up your heart. You, you'll do anything for such a person. So it's not such a complicated thing. So from humility, understanding our position, comes a sense of, of gratitude, and comes a sense of self-satisfaction. And in the, with that combination of elements, which is the nature of the heart of a devotee, one can be merciful. My problems are solved. By that I mean, Prabhupada's on a morning walk. It's on a tape, you can hear it. Prabhupada's in Mayapur. Prabhupada's on a morning walk. Prabhupada, you know, in the classic Socratic way, Prabhupada would come out with a statement and ask the devotees to challenge it or just try to, you know, rattle our brain. You know, we're set in a root or in a particular rut. And Prabhupada would just come out with something. Wait a minute, you know, it's great. So we're in the morning walk. Prabhupada says, devotees don't suffer. Now you have to understand, this is 1973. I think it was the second pilgrimage, but it was the first pilgrimage that a lot of devotees went from the West. <coughs> we didn't know anything about how to live in India. There was practically no uh, facility. We were staying, the only building was the Kanch building, which was unfinished. The temple room was finished, and there was Astatata Radhamadava were there, but we were just staying in a construction site. So, and, and the cooking, I mean, I don't know, I could spend time on it. The, the menu was do rice, cooked in such a way that it was completely burnt on one side, raw on the, on the top, and, you know, impersonal Brahman, all one in the middle, you know? <laughs> you, get ch you get a chunk of that, you'd get uh, dal with no veggies in it, watery dal, hot, went through you like lightning, and uh, maybe a guava, or you'd get a piece of that nice, which is the, in and of itself is good, gore, you know gore? But the big chunk of it, and you'd see them, it'd be black, they'd wave off the flies, break off a piece, and that's what you'd get. I mean, you know, we were covered with mosquito bites, we were sick, we, everybody had, you know, Mahatma Gandhi's weight loss program, I mean, everybody was really in trouble. And Prabhupada comes out with this, devotees don't suffer. So you can listen, there's this long pause. You know, he's walking with those big sannyasis and nobody says anything. And finally you hear Pancha Devita Maharaj, who has a distinctive voice, and he had a nice rasp with Prabhupada. You hear him say, ah, after this long pause, he says, ah, ah, Prabhupada, if the devotees aren't suffering, exactly what are they doing?
Yeah. <laughs> it sure looks like suffering to us, you know. And Prabhupada just laughed, you know, Prabhupada, because he caught it. He under, Prabhupada, that's, we're off the track, but it's the same time where Prabhupada says in his talk, you've all come at great distance, at great expense, and I can't even provide facility. And Prabhupada says, I cannot even give you milk. And Prabhupada starts to cry. It's just, you know, Prabhupada, you get a sense that Prabhupada, how much he cared for his disciples, you know, the Sankatan mission, the, how much they were giving. And Prabhupada actually, was sitting on the Vyasa Sun, began to cry. Just, you know, he, can, he was a control of his senses, but he began, he just thinking about, I can't even give you milk. So Prabhupada knew the, it, that he didn't know. But then, so Prabhupada laughed. And then Prabhupada says, but that's all right. He said, that's all right. After this life, back home, back to Godhead. So our problems are solved. Whatever suffering we're getting, ah, it's a token reaction from a past life. You know, I should get my head whacked off. I've got a headache instead. I've done so many stupid things. All right, it's a token reaction. Or sometimes devotees suffer to set an example for others, like the Pandavas. And then Prabhupada says in the, in the Bhagavatam, he says, the three reasons we suffer, one is token reaction, past misdeed. Another is that you teach the daughter-in-law by teaching the daughter. It's a token reaction. No, it's to set an example, Vaishnavas. And then Prabhupada said, sometimes Krishna just gives us a good kick. Don't stay in this place. Because the living entity is down. The living entity has a tendency to become stable. You know, a worm crawls back into the stool, Prabhupada's classic example. So, but every now and then we get a good kick. Don't stay here. So our problems are solved. We're going back home, back to Godhead. So with a Vaishnava's heart, all these good qualities, a sense of gratitude, uh, uh, a sense of uh, uh, self-satisfaction, the natural response is then, let me give mercy to others. Let me give mercy to others. And that is the Sankirtan mission. It comes from that Trinadapi Sunichena, which Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur said, we should wear as a garland around our necks. So I'm looking at the time. I just want to give a few. Well, let's just take Prophet's quality of humility. I mean, we could give a whole class and should give a whole class, but we'll just, because of the time factor. I was there, so I can assert, affirm, it's Detroit. Prabhupada's getting ready. I think he was flying to Chicago. I'm not sure where Prabhupada was going. Maybe Dallas. The airport is one of those hub airports. All the planes land and everybody comes in. There's a middle hub and then there's a main terminal out of it. Prabhupada's waiting for his plane. Probably at least 250, 350 devotees in the airport. And full bore. 10 Madungas, 15 pairs of cartels, conch shells, at least a dozen conch shells, sh showering flower petals. I mean, it was just, we took over the whole airport no, with no qualms, inhibitions. Devotees offering full bandavats, you know, right in the airport in front of Prabhupada's lotus feet. Now, the problem was, it was in the morning time, and you had many businessmen, they're trying to catch their connecting flights. They're trying to get through the terminal, you know, and they don't know what this, I mean, they, we might as well have been from Mars. They had no idea what, what this circus was. They had absolutely no way of processing it. But they knew they were going to miss their plane. So, you know, they got 15 people lined up, brahmacharis offering obeisances. How do they, how do they move forward, you know? They got devotees, you know, looking at Prabhupada. They're trying to push their way through. You know, and we were, assuming we aren't now, uh, quite passionate in those days. So we're looking at Srila Prabhupada in the middle of a kirtan. These guys are pushing us. We're, you fool, why aren't you offering obeisance to the pure devotee of Krishna? You know, poor guys just trying to get on his plane. You know, so it was like a tinderbox. You know, it was heating up. They were pushing and we were pushing and they were getting angry and we were getting, and it was going to blow up. It was, you know, welcome to America. It was going to be a brawl. It was going to be, you know, whack. So Rupanuga was the chairman of the GBC. Rupanuga Prabhu stood up on one of the chairs. So he was, and he said, all ISKCON devotees, 
all ISKCON devotees, please clear the terminal. <laughs> Not one single devotee moved. <laughs> Nobody. You're the only devotee who moved? Prabhupada picked up his japa mala and started to walk. No, 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 not you, Prabhupada, you stay the devotee. You know? Look at Prabhupada's thinking. One of my leaders is making an announcement. I, I'm an ISKCON devotee. He was fully compliant, you know, ready, ready. Well, the rest of us are all, who, who, what is he, you know. So that's an example of Prabhupada's humility. Uh, Trudy Kramarsh told me that he was, Prabhupada was speaking, I think, in London. I think Conway Hall, or I, I don't know, but he was speaking in London. And if you listen to the lectures, I mean, Prabhupada is just like a lion, you know, just jai. So, Trivi Pramarsh told me he felt like he was getting a prize fighter, you know, ready for his, you know, champion bout. So he, you know, how they there was massaging Prabhupada, and he was like, you know, they say go champ or you know whatever. So he was saying, oh Prabhupada, you know, you're the, the, the you know, the, the, the best representative of Krishna, and you, you are, you know, surcharged with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu Shakti, and, and he was going on, you know, and it's nice. It was actually very blissful that he was, you know, saying like that. Prabhupada was quiet, so he was going on for some time, and then Prabhupada slammed his hand on the mat and said, no, I am simply the servant of my Guru Maharaj. That's how Prabhupada was seeing. Last one and we'll end. I mean, I've, I had some other time we'll do it. But um, Rabindra Prabhu told me, Rabindra Surat Prabhu told me this, that there was a, Prabhupada's in Philadelphia, and Rabindra Prabhu was going to Temple University and he invited a Christian, and he didn't know that, he invited an Indian professor who was teaching religion and philosophy. So Rabindra invited him and the man came. Turns out the guy was a fundamentalist Christian, Indian, but fundamentalist Christian, sitting there with the devotees, Prabhupada. Says to Srila Prabhupada, I can understand that you are a Krishna Bhakta, but I am a Christian. And you are following an immoral, licentious Krishna. Just like that, right out in Prabhupada's face. Of all, you could hear a pin drop ribbon. People were shocked. Prabhupada says, no. Prabhupada says, I see that you're married. The man had a ring on, you know. I see that you're married. Prabhupada said, actually, you are immoral. Because Krishna is the only Purusha. Everyone else is Prakriti. And you are trying to enjoy one of Krishna's gopis. You, sir, are the thief. You, sir, are immoral. And it was great. You know, the guy was, he thought, oh, you know, I've got this simple Vaishnava, and I'm just going to twist him around it, you know. And he was just, the wind was knocked out of him. Providence, and on profound philosophy, had completely switched the tables and shown the guy to be a rascal. It was great. The man exploded. He actually been shouting at Prabhupada. He was shouting to the point that, again, one of the heroes, we stand on the shoulders of heroes, but we take the dust from heroes of uh, Brahmananda, you know, big, big size Brahmananda. Brahmananda, Rabindra said, Brahmananda came and said, I think you better leave now, sir. Boom. And he literally gave the guy the bumps rush. He just tossed him right out, tossed him right out, you know. I mean, we should not do that. But still, you know, Brahmananda Kijai. So, what can I say? I'm, in, you know, infected with the American disease of pride and passion. But here's the point I wanted to make. The... Rabindra, you know, such a gentle person, Rabindra Sarup, and he was so, he said, oh, Prabhupada, you know, I had no idea, I'm so embarrassed. Prabhupada wasn't bothered at all. But the devotees began a little conversation that what will happen to this man? I mean, he shouted, he actually swore in, in outrage at a pure devotee of Krishna. I mean, Bhakti Purushottamash gave that nice class yesterday about, you know, the dealing with pure devotees. So just imagine. So one devotee, they were all offering their suggestions what would happen. One devotee said, 
uh, well, you know, he'll have to burn forever in hell. No doubt about it. Another devotee said, oh, he'll be wandering like Ashwatthama in the Himalayas with, you know, like that, and no shelter. Another one said, oh, he'll be in Calcutta, no arms and legs, playing a harmonica, you know, whatever. What happened to this guy? So everybody offered their drink boiling ghee, you know, give up his body. Everybody offered their, you know, heinous suggestions to, to compensate. Everybody got it out of their system. It was Prophet's turn. Prophet, he was looking at something. Prophet looked up and Prophet said, well, we could forgive him. Nobody had thought of that. Nobody had, but Prophet in his innocent heart, pure Vaishnava heart, that uh, Prophet said, Rabindu told me, I must have offended him in a previous life. Now he's come to take his revenge. That's how Prabhupada saw it. And we can forgive him. So the, in summation will end that we want to live in a better world. We want to be part of a better world. We want to become happy. We want to perfect the human form of life. It begins with Trinadapi Sunichena. It begins with humility. And our consciousness changes and the world changes and everyone becomes happy. So we can end there. Thank you very much, Hare Krishna.